The architects of our modern system of manufactured consent and official propaganda have long known the importance of the mass media in framing public opinion on any given event. To the pathocrats who blazed the trail toward our modern era of information warfare and opinion control, facts themselves were malleable, subject not to objective reality, but to the way they were perceived and internalized by a credulous public. As Ivy Lee, the man that the Rockefellers hired to invent the modern PR industry after the Ludlow Massacre put it, it is not the facts alone that strike the popular mind, but the way in which they take place and in which they are published that kindle the imagination. Besides, what is a fact? The effort to state an absolute fact is simply an attempt to give you my interpretation of the facts. This disdain for the public and the psychopathic ease with which elected officials lie to their electorate is nowhere more apparent than when a democracy attempts to rally its citizens to support a war of aggression abroad. If truth is the first casualty of war, the battlefield where that casualty takes place is in the mind of the liar's own citizenry. Sadly, recent events have provided no shortage of examples of this phenomenon. In the early days of the Iraq War, media analyst Andrew Tindall examined 414 news stories aired by ABC, CBS, and NBC about the build-up to the war, finding that 380 of them, a staggering 92%, sourced back to one of three U.S. government agencies, the White House, the State Department, and the Pentagon. A further study found that of 574 stories aired between Bush's speech to the UN in September 2002 and the beginning of the Iraq War in 2003, only 12 stories, just 2%, dealt with the possible aftermath of the invasion. Perhaps unsurprisingly, a remarkably similar pattern has played out in the years-long propaganda campaign to convince the American, British, and Western public in general of the need for armed intervention in Syria. A September 2013 study from Pew Research found that in the wake of the chemical weapons attack in Ghouta in August, the coverage of the Syrian war debate on cable news networks from supposedly different viewpoints was almost identical. The study found that Al Jazeera America, CNN, and BBC America all framed their reports in substantially similar ways and relied on substantially similar sources, including by far their most common three sources, the White House, the Congress, and the military. A further study in October of this year by the Public Accountability Initiative found that many of the so-called Syria experts relied on by the Western media to provide commentary on the Syrian conflict had direct financial ties to the defense industry, exactly as had been previously exposed in coverage of the Iraq War. None of this is surprising to those who have been following the media coverage of the Syrian conflict from the beginning. Indeed, alternative media pundits have been pointing out the obviously biased coverage of the conflict since its very inception. What are the, ma the main uh, points of view that you'll be uh, raising in this documentary? Okay, so the main, the main points is basically to deconstruct the main fabrications uh, that have been put forward by the global media, mainly the Western media and channels, uh, particularly Al Jazeera and Arabia. Uh, and these fabrications are that the uh, army is uh, on a mass scale, systematic scale, killing uh, peaceful protesters. Um, that there is no democracy in Syria, that there is no respect for human rights, uh, and that there is no support for President Bashar al-Assad. So uh, the documentary deals with all of these fabrications and in, in effect shows that actually in many of the cases uh, they're just complete uh, and outright lies. Syrians who oppose the destruction of their country accuse Canada's public broadcaster of lacking impartiality in its reportage on Syria. They say that the majority of Syrians support the Syrian government, and yet the CBC has been one-sided, legitimating and amplifying the perspective of supporters of the foreign-backed militant groups that have been killing the ordinary Syrian people. The same people that you are expecting that did September 11 are fighting the people in Syria. They are the same, and you're supporting them, which doesn't really make any sense. That just proves that... September 11 was a big joke. It was a big lie. The Amnesty International report that comes out today is the type of uh, attention-getting, headline-grabbing report that seems to go fit in line with the dominant narrative of how the Syrian uh, government is, is, of course, just torturing people and killing them at will, and, uh, and that something must be done to stop this. But as that report pointed out, of course, the Amnesty International report itself is based on eyewitness reports, not on the fact, on the ground reporting. And uh, it's based on the ideas of, of people who are 
are being implicated in this. I mean, the, the people who are part of the supposed opposition to this government. So so it's it's a little bit like uh, creating a report uh, asking whether the banks were to blame for the 2008 financial meltdown and only talking to people from Goldman Sachs. I mean, we know which way that uh, that type of report is going to go. And uh, and so there has to be some skepticality of these types of reports. And I don't think we, we necessarily need to, to remind people just how uh, important it is to be skeptical of, of all media reports in these times, especially when there seems to be a push towards uh, rallying the public around a military intervention. But but again, it has happened time and time and time and time again in, in recent history, even let alone longer periods of history. And, and we see it, unfortunately, perhaps coming to fruition again here in Syria. The beginning of the campaign to frame public opinion on Syria can be traced back at least as far as 2006, when the Bush administration first approved U.S. government funding and training for opposition forces in the country, but began in earnest after the conflict broke out in 2011. From the early days of the Syrian conflict, Western media outlets including CNN relied on dubious activist Danny Diem, known as Syria Danny, for coverage on the ground in the war-torn country. However, after Syria Danny was exposed for staging his reports, Anderson Cooper invited him on his program, not to explain why he was staging fictitious reports, but to explain how the evidence of that fakery made its way onto the internet. Denny, Syrian state television, as you know, is now airing uh, excerpts of, uh, of this video of you uh, that was shot. Uh, I'm not sure how they got uh, this video. Do you know how they got it? Did they intercept it? Um, while I was trying to talk to CNN, I was online for like 20 minutes. So it's live broadcast. I don't know how they got it. We was, this is all private. See, we should have. This has all been deleted. We have to delete all this stuff. <laughs> In March 2012, several key staff from Al Jazeera's Beirut Bureau, including the Bureau's managing director, a correspondent, and a producer, all resigned in protest of the network's bias in its coverage of the Syria conflict. Well, we're receiving information now about the reported resignations of key employees in Al Jazeera's Beirut office, and they are claiming that the channel has a very provocative stance and has been involved in agenda-setting biased reporting. These resignations include the managing director, the correspondent, and the producer. And specific reports that we are hearing, particularly from the correspondent, is that Al Jazeera refused to publish pictures of armed fighters clashing with the Syrian army. And in addition, and also ignored a referendum on a new constitution in Syria. In August of 2012, the BBC released a video report showing members of the Syrian terrorist insurgency planning to trick a prisoner into becoming an unwitting suicide bomber, a war crime under the Geneva Conventions. The rebels appear to be treating him well, offering him cigarettes and a shower, and he's told that he'll be released as part of a prisoner exchange. <laughs> Blindfolded, he's driven towards the city. He's told all he'll have to do is drive the truck towards a government checkpoint. What he doesn't know is the truck is the one that's been rigged with a 300 kilo bomb. After independent media started to draw attention to the clip, it was quickly removed from the BBC website and copyright violations were posted on YouTube copies of the footage. And in the wake of the recent Syrian chemical weapons attack, the BBC aired an interview with a dubious medical expert that appeared to have had its soundtrack drastically altered in two different versions of the interview, broadcast in separate reports. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looks like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of, and I'm not really sure, maybe napalm, something similar to that. But obviously, within the chaos of the situation, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on. It's just absolute chaos and carnage here. Um, we've had a massive influx of what looked like serious burns. It seems like it must be some sort of chemical weapon. I'm not really sure. As Michelle Chosodowski, director for the Center of Research on Globalization in Montreal, points out, however, as egregious as these manipulations are, even the more balanced critiques, such as Seymour Hersh's recent reporting on the U.S. government's manipulation of its intelligence over the chemical weapons attack in Gouda, still exclude the key information which would help the public understand what is really happening in Syria. This insurgency was launched in mid-March uh, mid 2011 
in the border city of Dara. It was not a protest movement at the time. You don't run a protest movement in Plattsburgh, New York. Okay, Dara is to, uh, Dara is to Jordan what, uh, what uh, Plats Plattsburgh, New York is to Canada, so to speak. Uh, the protest movement did not erupt in a, in a sleepy border city of 40,000 inhabitants. Uh, and anybody who had some minimal understanding of, and had read the press reports would know that right from the beginning, this was an incursion of death squads, snipers who were shooting on security forces, and it was actually confirmed with the, the data on, on mortality and, and, and so on. They were involved in acts of arson and so on and so forth. As the crisis unfolded, we saw a whole series of atrocities. And the media would say that these atrocities were committed by the government of Bashar al-Assad. The absurd proposition is that uh, the government was actually killing its own people. And, and uh, when in fact... These atrocities were committed, and I should say they were committed on the orders of the Western Military Alliance using the rebels um, as proxies. Uh, so that this is not a civil war, this is an invasion, this is a war of aggression. Uh, most of the rebels which are actively involved in the conflict, uh, which, are the, which are trained and visible in the in the in the in, in the war theater are um, mercenaries from um, from Arab countries, but also from a number of Western countries. Among them are uh, private uh, mercenaries from private security companies. Uh, in other words, former special forces from SAS or French parachutists, and so on. They are there and they are coordinating the rank and file of these rebels, many of, many of whom are, are actually people who have been recruited on the roadside. And so that uh, to obviate the fact that this is a war of aggression rather than a civil war, from my point of view, is, is tacit media disinformation. Because it doesn't allow us to understand the logic of this crisis and the logic of this crisis is to destroy a country, literally, to, to destroy its institutions, to kill people. Uh, it's what General Tommy Franks, Commander-in-Chief of, uh, of Central Command during the Iraq campaign, he used the term massive casualty producing event. Now, a massive casualty producing event has a particular ideological construct behind it. It is meant to create a, a sentiment of, of solidarity in relation to the victims, okay? Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's war propaganda. You kill people and then you blame the enemy for having perpetrated these acts of, of these atrocities. So that the, the media at the outset literally inundated us with reports that Bashar al-Assad was killing his people, they were showing pictures of this, when in fact all along it was the Western Military Alliance who was killing those people, who was ordering its, its uh, rebel uh, militia who were led by Western Special Forces uh, to undertake these massive casualty producing events with a view to, first of all, destabilizing Syrian society, creating sectarian divisions in a secular Muslim society, uh, tremendously tolerant with uh, 2,000, with 4,000 years of history going back to Mesopotamia. But at the same time, it's the destruction of the institutions of that country. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Syrian war coverage of the mainstream media is not its underlying bias. That was always to be expected. But how remarkably ineffective that coverage has been in convincing the public of the need for military intervention in the country. After nearly three years of relentless propaganda, attempting to convince the public of the virtue of the terrorist insurgency and the incomparable evil of Assad, the seemingly inevitable march toward war in the wake of the Ghouta chemical weapons attack faltered after public opinion overwhelmingly came down on the side of non-interventionist policies. 
Perhaps reading public sentiment, many mainstream outlets even took to pointing out the media bias on the war and trying to retroactively position themselves against military intervention. This has to be credited to a remarkable, global, grassroots phenomenon of independent citizen media breaking through the layers of propaganda to provide true, cogent analysis of the situation on the ground in Syria. In the face of generations swayed by the mass media manipulation of Ivy Lee and his ideological progeny, this alternative media movement is setting the foundation for an alternative paradigm in which Lee's cynical rhetorical question, what is a fact, has a very different answer than that which the ruling classes would want us to believe.